At the end of a long day of hunting or fishing, there's nothing more welcome than a taut, weather-tight cabin like this one. On the other hand, there's nothing much worse than a cabin that lets too much of the outdoors come indoors, including rain, snow, and cutting winds. I'm Gritz Gresham. Today, we're going to find out how almost anyone can build a first-class log cabin of his own from scratch. Your cabin can be as simple or elaborate as you like for use as a snug retreat on weekends or vacations, or even as a full-time home. And you can build it in any kind of country you choose, in a wilderness or a woodlot. Drew Braun conducts a school in log cabin building in Sisters, Oregon. His students actually help in building cabins, shaping the logs so they fit together perfectly, with little or no need for chinking. Today, Drew and instructor Lance Ramsey will show us how practically anyone who can carve his initials can build a cabin. Some of the basic tools that we use are a peeling spud for peeling the logs, a PV for moving and rolling the logs, log dogs, to hold our logs in place, an axe, a chainsaw, and a set of scribes to mark the logs. Other than these tools, you just need a basic set of carpentry tools. The method of building we will teach you today is the Norwegian scribe method. Here we have a set of Douglas fir logs, but actually you can use any soft wood you like. You can use cedar, pine, spruce, whatever available in your area. We've let these logs season for a little bit over a year, and this min minimizes shrinkage when we're actually building. We have enough logs here, about 70 of them, to build a small cabin and roof structure. The first thing we do before we set the logs on the wall is to peel the logs. Okay, we've selected these logs to be pretty much uniform in size and very little taper. This makes the building of your house much easier. While we're peeling, we want to look for anything peculiar about the log. For example, a cat face or where the bow is or whatever. Because you'll find that every log is different. But we've also found that we haven't found a log that can't be laid yet. If you don't take the bark off, it makes it really rough to scribe. And the bark will fall off anyway later which means that you'll constantly be cleaning up your house after it's built. Okay, after we peel the logs, the next step is to put the logs on the building. We have a truck here that has a self-loading logging device that we use, but there are many different ways that you can put logs on a building. Uh, you can use skids, you can use a skyline, which is stringing a cable with a, between two trees. The important thing is to figure out whatever system is the easiest. Because once you get the logs on the building, building a log house is really not that strenuous or difficult. Now you need to be careful when setting logs on a building that you set them far enough inside the building that they won't roll off. This building we're building here is on temporary piers, and we will mark the logs and move the building after it's completed. Okay, once the log's on the building, we roll the log to find out where the bow is. Because building, when building with logs, we always put the bow up. After we find the bow, we now center the log over the wall below it. Lance will now put in a log dog to hold the log in place. When rolling the logs, we always roll the logs into the building and never towards the outside. This is a primary safety factor. Okay, now that we've got the log centered and cut to length, we look down the entire log to find the shortest distance between the two logs. We've set our scribes to that distance and then we mark for the first notch. Okay, now that we've determined the shortest distance between the two logs and set our scribe, Lance will now take the scribe and make a mark on the log. 
He marks both sides of the log, and this will show us where to cut the first notch. Now that we've scribed the log, we roll the log over to be cut. Again, we use the log dog to hold the log in place. The chainsaw is used to do all the rough work of notches. To rough out the notches, Lance uses just the tip of the guide bar. With it, he makes a series of parallel cuts, always keeping the guide bar within the scribed lines. Though easy, this roughing out demands caution. The worker must hold his saw firmly to prevent a dangerous kickback. When the sawing is completed, the ridges that remain on the log can be quickly knocked out with hand tools. Okay, now we use the tip of the chainsaw to come down close to the line. We now use a hammer and a chisel to do the finish work. Okay, now that we've finished the rough notch, we roll the log back into place and we again center the log on the wall. As you can see, we alternate the butts and the top all the way up the, the wall. This will help keep the building level. We still have a gap here between the two logs. We will again scribe and mark the entire log this time and cut a V groove out of the bottom of the log. This will allow us to get the tight fits that we have on the logs below. With the log notched and dropped closer to the log below, the groove marks now can be accurately inscribed on it. Okay, now we've inscribed the entire log. The length, we've rescribed the notch and even the end of the logs on both sides. What we'll do now is we'll roll the log back into place and begin the long process of cutting the entire log to fit the log below it. The notches at the ends of the log will be enlarged and a groove will be cut on its underside. The tip of the guide bar makes shallow, precise cuts along the groove lines and then these cuts are deepened. The groove and notches are roughed out with a series of parallel cuts. And finally, the ridges and blocks that remain will be chiseled away. For extra protection from cold weather, a strip of fiberglass insulation can be sandwiched between logs when the upper one is rolled into place on the lower. Okay, now that we've done the rough cutting with the chainsaw, we knock out the blocks with a hammer Okay, the final step in cutting the log is the chiseling. And you can see that we chisel down right to the line. This takes quite a while, but it's well worth it. This is what gives us our airtight fits. Okay, what we have here is a finished log. As you can see, we've chiseled the entire length of the log right down to the line to get our perfect fit. The average log builder can lay two of these a day, and each log by itself is a piece of artwork. And that's why there are no two log houses that are ever the same. Right now, I'm going to roll the log into place, and this is what we call the moment of truth, to see actually how good your skill was in cutting the log, and to see how tight your fit is. And I'd say that's a good fit and log. With the Norwegian scribe method, all of our cuts face downward. And with the tight fit, any moisture or rain or water will run off the logs down to the ground and cannot get inside to affect your logs. And you can see by the size of these logs that they're tremendous insulation. And in the wintertime, they keep you warm. And in the summertime, they keep you cool. We cut out our doors and windows as we go. This saves on material, and it also saves on labor. 
you can see the involved process of cutting a log. And if we can work with shorter logs and not have to cut out a big section like this and throw it away, uh, it's a lot easier. These windows here are rough openings to the specifications of the window sizes, and they'll be finished at a later time when the building's done. When the log work is done, we take a high-powered water sprayer and we wash the inside and outside of the log house. Then we take a solution of 50% linseed oil and 50% mineral spirits. And if necessary, we add an insecticide at this time. When you build your own log house, you'll develop a pride of craftsmanship. And if properly taken care of, the house will last for hundreds of years. Again, I want to emphasize the key to the airtight fit is in the use of these scribes and in developing your skill. You need to be able to copy the contour of the bottom log exactly to the top log so you can cut the log to ensure the tight fit. A cabin built with Drew Braun's instructions is stronger and snugger than most conventional houses, and its rustic design and materials fit perfectly in unspoiled surroundings. Like the fields and the forest, a good log cabin just seems natural. This is Homer Circle, and today our travels begin on the Cumberland River in Tennessee. This old time excursion boat, we're not far from Nashville, the capital of country music. We're making this cruise so we can meet country musician Jim Knowles. He's a man who loves to fish, as you may have guessed while listening to this song. Get up there and drive this boat. Knowles is one of those clever folks who have made their fishing a way of life. He earns his living not only by strumming and singing, but also by guiding fishermen. Today he's guiding Glenn Lau, who's an enthusiastic angler and also the producer of Sports Appeal. The location is Old Hickory Lake, a huge impoundment on the Cumberland. They'll be fishing for white bass, and Knowles uses an electronic depth finder to locate a hump on the lake bottom where the bass hang out. When it shows up on the finder, he tosses a float to market. The line unrolls until the anchor touches bottom. Then he maneuvers the boat moving it upwind and putting it in position on the deep water nearby. There, he'll drop anchor. So you want to be as close to the white pump. bass is a fast, yeah. exciting game fish that's related to the striped bass. It moves and feeds in large schools. Where you find one white bass, you often find hundreds. So you, what, you get as close to that marker as possible? Or casting distance. Casting distance. It'll stay right close to the stumps, right to the eddy. Red and chats in there too. Food, gorgeous. Yeah. Okay, I'll get up here. Drop in. I'll tell you, Jim, the mystery to a lot of people that go fishing is how do you know they're fish here? What do, what do you exactly are you looking for? Well, we came out from uh, 20 feet of water, which is the old river channel, into about seven. It's a hump there, and there's stumps on that hump, and there's current in the river, it creates a, an eddy. It's your forage fish, your threadfin shad stay in that eddy. It's consequently to eat the rest of the game fish will fall. Well, what you're saying to me then is that these fish are congregated around these humps out of the channels, and that they're bait fish in there that they're feeding on. Right. And what you try to do is find a place where the hump comes up, and uh, chances are that that's where you're going to find the fish. And mainly what we're talking about is white bass. Right. They uh, normally, during the morning when the generators are on, the dams, create this current in this river right here. And uh, from 9 o'clock on till 4 or 5 in the afternoon, that's where you'll find them. Okay, what are we going to fish with? Uh, rooster tails, mostly. Uh, number two rooster tail, a split shot, about two split shots about it. 
Would any That's spinner it. work? Any spinner would work. Uh, I have a problem with twisting line. And the rooster tail doesn't seem to twist that much. And plus the two split shots help it from twisting. Is this what you would recommend for a normal person that was coming out here white bass fishing to put a spinner on like this? Yeah, definitely. It, uh, most novices carry a three to one ratio reel and this spinner will work three to one ratio. Does your dentist recommend you biting that split shot on like that? No, he doesn't recommend that. I don't tell him. Okay, I'm ready to go fishing. Let's go. Now they'll hit right off bottom, is that right? Yeah, right off bottom. Yeah, Sometimes. Close to the bottom. Is oh, there one hit right at the boat. <laughs> One got it right at the boat. Come on. Nice fish. Yeah, yeah, that's a good one. Let me get him in here. Ah, there we go. There we go. Isn't that pretty? Nice color on him. That's a fun fish. I'm going to put him in your live well here. Okay. Do your tag in a little later, huh? Jim, tell me about that white bass project that you're involved in. Well, the tagging of 500 fish being tagged uh, by me, catching them by hand, and uh, releasing them. That's uh, through the Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency. And uh, I've got 200 as of the day tagged. Well, when the tag comes back in, tell me how much it's grown, the weight, also, a lot about migration routes, where it's gone, some of the things uh, these schools of strike do, like whether it, they go upstream or downstream in a particular year. In the spring, uh, normally, what normally most of them do, will go upstream from the dam. This lake is 88 miles long, and I've had one uh, return that were, was uh, about uh, 80 miles upstream from here. And one returned only a half a mile from where I put it in the water. Oh, you feel them bumping? Yeah. Okay, here you are. Yeah. Got one? Yeah. What would be a big white bass? Oh, it's like three and a half, maybe four pounder. Wow, that's good sound. Noel's gets tremendous pleasure from the white bass tagging program he conducts for the state of Tennessee. He does the work on his own time without pay. He's supplying data that will help the state to protect the bass and provide better fishing. He attaches a numbered tag close to the rear dorsal fin. The tag does not harm the fish. Then he measures the fish for length working quickly, but handling it carefully. It's 13 inches long. Finally, he'll weigh it. When other fishermen catch a bass that Knowles has tagged, they return the tag to the state and collect a $5 reward for doing so. A pound, two and a half ounces. Before getting back to his fishing, Knowles records the length and weight of the bass he's just released. Oop, there's one hit it right by the boat. Oh, he's going around the anchor. This is a nice fish. <laughs> Woo! Come on. Oh, look at this. Oh, boy. This is a nice fish. Listen, sound. New, 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 new. Look here. Look at here, Jim. Look at Oh, yeah. Yeah, nice. Pretty? <laughs> oh, boy. Look at that. Boy, that's nice. That's nice. I'm going to take this lure off the easy way. Put him in the, in the pool back here, and you can measure him up. Okay. All right. All right. Well, where are you going, partner? I think you had a little one on. The big one ate the little one. Must have. You get line, I'll get home, baby. You get line. Good. Good. 
Jim Knowles is a man of many talents. He's a country musician, a fishing guide, and an amateur fisheries researcher. Most of all, he's a genuine sportsman, a man who loves to fish more than anything else and is doing his part to improve fishing in the future, here on Old Hickory Lake in the heartland of Tennessee.